Well, my name is Simon Yost. Uh, welcome. I uh, work for Spry, one of the sponsors of Drupal Camp. So we're excited to have you here. And uh, as you know, um, like Drupal is a labor of love. So it's just fun to be in the room with like-minded people, and and it's fun to be here locally, you know, in our city and such, doing all this stuff. So. Um, I've been doing Drupal stuff for about 12 years, so what that meant is I started with Drupal 5, and what that meant is people thought I was crazy at some point, right? Because it just was very, very arcane at some point. We've come a long way, um, thank goodness, but uh, we've been doing this for a while and um, uh, done several different roles um, in Drupal projects. Uh, I've been inside agencies, uh, building sites for clients, inside organizations, building sites for the organization. Uh, so I've been on both sides of that. Uh, most recently, I've also helped teach front-end development at Washington University here in St. Louis. And so uh, hopefully this talk today gives a little bit of perspective to a lot of the team uh, that, that makes up a Drupal project and not just one perspective. Um, so we've also been, my wife and I have been in St. Louis for nine years. We love St. Louis. So it's just fun, again, to have something like this on our home turf, so to speak. Uh, excited to be here. So to talk about managing Drupal projects, obviously we're making an assumption that you're using Drupal, so we're making that assumption uh, because that's why we're all here today, but I don't take that lightly. So uh, obviously there's a lot of different choices uh, to build your systems with and, and this is just how we're gonna talk about it today. So if you are choosing Drupal, then you're kind of picking a way and I talk about it going with the grain. So if you're using Drupal, uh, you, know, you could um, just use it, I guess, for like user authentication and then do everything else um, outside of core or with custom stuff, but uh, oftentimes you're, you're using Drupal to do something uh, that you, you couldn't do um, from scratch. So uh, we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna assume that we're going with the grain of Drupal and kind of talk about um, going from that perspective. And so um, I think that there's a few things to keep in mind about why we're going with the grain of Drupal. Uh, I think it helps us clarify project goals and outcomes. So we're not starting from some anamorphous place. It gives us some context of why we're starting. Hopefully it aligns the project team a little bit. Um, you know, if, if someone um, is just thinking that they're going to build a static site or if they're going to start, you know, uh, doing something, uh, how, how they would look, hook up to Angular or something like that, hopefully this kind of pulls everybody back and centers them on one place. Um, maybe it provides the client a baseline as well. So, uh, you know, the client's going to ask for functionality, but knowing up front, maybe even through the sales process that they're using Drupal, gives them kind of a baseline to start talking through and for you to start talking about features to them. And then hopefully it creates efficiencies. So, right, that's the whole goal of why we would use open source software and why many of us are excited about Drupal 8 is that it creates some efficiencies that we wouldn't get uh, without a, a system like that. And so then as the nature of project management goes, we need to somehow quantify projects and, um, and split them into pieces to do so. Some, some way to kind of uh, not only wrap our ha heads around the whole project, but get into some different slices. And so um, I've been uh, trying for a long time to kind of find the right mix of how, how do you slice this stuff up and how is it relevant from the beginning of the project where you're talking about things with the client and your team and, and you have a pretty blank canvas so to speak all the way to the end uh, to even what we talked about during the keynote of where when you're documenting, testing, shipping uh, and then even after launch, how, how can you talk about stuff in one way so that you have um, a great lens if you will to speak through all the way through the process. And so again the question becomes how do we divide it into pieces and I call these uh, systems uh, I, I probably need a better word, so if, if anybody has a better name for this, that's fine. Things like features and everything is already taken. Um, but this is my answer to building Drupal sites with the grain, so to speak, and that you're assuming that they're going to grow and change. So I talk a lot about um, building sites for like one year out, day 365, right? You, you're not just building a site for launch day. You want it to be relevant and you want people to be coming back to it. Um, a year or more later. You also, and maybe this is inferred, but you want the client to be using it because they have to make the content, right? You actually need people to be logging into the system and using it. Um, it's not just gonna be what it is at launch and then they don't touch it again. So uh, that's kind of the, one of the metrics of success that, that I think through when we're doing projects and, uh, and kind of intuitive in all this stuff. So I mean a crude comparison, right, of these, these kind of things that we're building for projects is a city, they have some kind of infrastructure that's that's rigid and some kind of then dynamic organic piece as well. So maybe this is why all of us fell in love with SimCity back in the day, right? You could kind of <laughs> try to pick your pieces and kind of see what happens and obviously you have many different results. So let's dive into what I'm calling systems and we'll get really specific on that. If, you know, you can mention me on social media if you have any better names for what to call this, I'd be really, um, 
I, I love ideas, but this is what we'll call it for today. Uh, so what I'm defining a system is is a way to collect and marry user-facing and administrative functions, things like business requirements, user stories, content, UI design, and back-end functionality. So we'll kind of go through different examples of what all those are in a minute, and obviously everybody's uh, interacted with those a lot. Um, but you know, business requirements, you're doing rules. I think this incorporates clients' best practices. But a big one, right, is customer interaction. So if you're doing a shopping cart feature, you really need to understand how uh, clients or customers, constituents of the organization, interact with that organization. And, and this is where to capture that. Um, user stories. We, we, we talk about user stories because it matters what it what the system is going to be complete. What does it look like when it's complete? What's the, the desired result or the preferred future? That's one of the things we can capture with user stories. Uh, content's really important. This is kind of coming from a content first mentality of we need the content to do something, not design something and then wait to get the content later. Uh, UI design, obviously we all got this. We can make pretty pictures with Photoshop or however we choose to do it. So, so that's pretty straightforward. And then back end stuff in Drupal speak, content types, blocks, views, custom modules, the list goes on. So uh, before we get into that, let's look at why not build uh, things a certain way really quick. Um, and again, everybody has their different uh, idea of how to organize this stuff, so there's no only one way. But um, we'll look at really quick maybe some of the disadvantages of using just screens or comps to think about something. Um, wireframes could fit into that category as well. Maybe there's some, also some downsides to just thinking through a module lens platforms and integrations. So we'll use this very nice square to uh, represent our project really quick. And again, the question is, how do we break this into pieces? And so if we just start with the idea of screens, we get you know one nice little column there going across the side. The rest of our project definition is still pretty anamorphous. And we could put some thoughts to that, but there's no real um, label, language, swath across the whole thing that we can use to talk about it um, in terms of one piece. We're always broken up by the design and then everything else. Um, maybe you could talk about your, your site in terms of modules, right? There's great modules and, and uh, core modules as well as contrib modules and then your custom modules in Drupal and those are very important. Uh, but you get modules that are coming through a lot of different uh, layers of the project. You might have some modules that go all the way through to the UI layer and almost um, demand the user workflow, right? And then you get other modules that uh, aren't even going to uh, bounce up into the theme layer and are just going to sit in the background and do things. And so, uh, again, that might be a way, but it leaves a lot of open spaces uh, and it's hard to talk about anything kind of as a whole. Um, we can talk about platforms, right? So maybe you might use um, something with like Civi CRM with Drupal or Salesforce and Red Hen with Drupal many other uh, ideas of that. Um, and then you kind of terms of like, okay, this part of the project is Drupal, this part of the project is Civi or Salesforce or you know what have you. And, and that it also just kind of gets you to large chunks and you need a way potentially to get more specific. Um, and then if you're dealing with integrations, especially if you're using Drupal for a lot of things, you're just gonna kind of end up with bits and pieces here and there, uh, not something uh, potentially that is able to get a, a, a chunk of your project, a slice of your project that is reusable. So what we're recommending is the idea of systems that gives you these kind of slices down your project or across your project, however you want to view it, uh, that you can then uh, quantify. So that's kind of what we're talking about and this is what we're saying is that these uh, can house business requirements, user stories, content, UI and business uh, backend functionality all into one thing. So uh, sometimes we talk about it like a coat rack, like the system is the rack and, uh, um, sorry, the site is the rack and then all of these things, all these coats are hanging on it. And we're, we're looking for units that can uh, accept all of these different things and aren't just one sided or, or only have one aspect. So uh, obviously this is, a, this is a very simple analogy. We need to get more specific and so then the question becomes is uh, how do we quantify or document something like this? And so this is where it starts to get tricky because you're dealing with people that have a lot of different um, learning styles and a lot of different thought patterns. It's really easy to become rigid here. Uh, even in the keynote we talked about reusing functionality and that's a great uh, um, byproduct of open source and a great reason to, to commit to open source. But we need to kind of have uh, uh, an idea of here of um, how open are our hands? Are these things that we're just, you know, uh, photocopying and just reproducing left and right? Or are these things that are a little bit more organic 
Uh, and so how we talk about this uh, sometimes is using like a pie recipe. So this is not Sara Lee out of the freezer section, right? These are uh, good homemade pie recipes. You might recommend it to someone uh, as with anything that, you know, you might know a friend that has a specialty that they, they cook or bake. Uh, it's going to be a little different every time. They might use a few different ingredients, but, you know, they might be known for what they, they make. And, um, and then also that you have different kinds of pies in this case. You could do this with any kind of uh, recipe, but that, that you're not, everything is not the exact same. Um, and yet it can be intentional with some kind of thought and, um, and replication. So, uh, then what makes that recipe up? And so these are the things we're going to look at here for a few minutes is what are some of the things that you could add to one of these system definitions to actually make it helpful and specific? So uh, we, we're going to just kind of go through examples of these. Um, we we uh, want a summary first. We're going to start off talking about that. Uh, we find it uh, surprising that, you know, you can have something as simple as a blog, which we're going to look at today. And... Um, Obviously, you, you're dealing with really smart people, and your team is great, and everybody knows exactly what you're doing, and then the meeting's over, and they go on to something else, and everybody forgets the nuance, right, that was, was in the conversation when you were there. So this is about uh, doing something like um, uh, Dan and Chip Heath's book, uh, Made to Stick, they call it Commander Intent, or, uh, you know, it might be like a tweet Length thing. We're not talking about something you go have your content person write, <laughs> right? You're, you're talking about something that your team can just sit down either at the whiteboard or on a napkin and, and make up. Uh, business requirements. These might be um, inferred at some point. So again, this isn't where you go off and, and you're writing down every single thing. This is, this is something you're capturing the big pieces and the pieces that are potentially counterintuitive or nuanced with that feature, that client. User stories, um, we've been using these uh, primarily for testing in, in our uh, recent process at Spry, but this is a way to capture uh, not only um, things to test against, but also to help explore user roles. We'll give an example of that. Um, content, we really believe that it's important to start with content and not wait for content. So we'll include that even in the definition of here's some examples of content that's gonna go into this system. And if it's not a marketing system, right, if it's a back-end system, if it, if it houses a product, uh, for inventory, that's just as important of content as if it's on the front page um, and, and, you know, hundreds of people are going to see it. Back-end functionality then, right, which is kind of the reason we're here at Drupal Camp is to learn about back-end functionality and stuff like that, and then we'll talk about specific examples of how to include that from a Drupal perspective. So um, we'll go through and use the, um, the Spry blog as an example. So um, there's a, kind of a widget here on the homepage of the Spry blog that has... Um, a blog role, if you will, and that houses, um, you know, in Drupal speak, this would be like a block view, something to that effect, and then um, you would go in and then you would be in one blog post, obviously. This is the simplest example of a system, and so we'll use this, uh, hopefully everybody understands what it is right off the bat, and we'll just talk about how we can quantify it and, and write it down. So. Um, the first thing we would give an example of is this kind of summary thing we talked about, and I use words uh, like this, an index of posts published by such and such organization that gives context to recent news and events. It sounds really simple. Let me go through some of the reasons why I think this is important. Um, an index. You could use whatever word you want to. That's my word that clues our team into. We decided to use a dynamic system and not just one free-for-all page. So using a content type, whatever you want to call it, um, that we're going to use something like that uh, with content types, views, that kind of stuff, and it's not just going to be one uh, freeform page. Um, that, that's a word I use to clue our team into that. Um, I think the published by the organization, uh, this is important. Like you're you're trying to uh, say right off the bat, like is this content going to be uh, you know long form blog post, something like that that someone's going to write on behalf of the organization? You know, some people have blogs that are like they shoot out to articles that are written on other sites. Trying to capture that right here. You can use a couple words to do it, and it really adds clarity to what we're building. Um, and then again, maybe the context of what we're talking about, recent news and events, or something to give the team and remember, okay, here, this is what we're capturing. This is what the content's gonna be focused on. So that would be an example of a blog summary. Super easy, you can write it in your sleep. Having it written down, we think is really important. Um, business requirements. These could be things like public facing, um, 
uh, blog to anonymous users, right? It's really important that you're, you're trying to denote the audience, make that clear, um, and help understand how that interfaces with user roles because in, in our world, user roles and, and stuff like that is part of requirements. We, we want to list the author's name and, and photo, potentially with the post. Uh, at, this is, a, again, an example from Spry. Um, sometimes that gets confusing. You know, are we going to be able to see things by author or not? And just writing bullet points down like this right off the bat give us really um, important information that we need. Uh, this is, again, kind of gets into a little Drupal-y speak. We want a landing page, a full post. So we're not going to do teasers in this case. Filtered by published and sorted by post date descending. Really quick sentence, uh, if you're building a view, it gets you 95% of the way, right? So uh, it's a simple sentence that can really help add clarity. Um, this is an example, maybe you want uh, a blog post approval system or maybe the client doesn't, right? It, it could go any way, a number of different ways. So noting that right off the bat, is this going to be uh, every user for themselves publishing things? Does there need to be an approval system? And at this point, maybe all you need to write down is yes or no, unless they have a really specific detail for that. Uh, and then out of that, things like we're going to provide a blogger user, someone that's going to be able to get in and write a post. We're going to be able to provide another user role that helps um, approve those. Really simple stuff. But just listing it off the bat, um, it could be really helpful uh, to keep everybody going in the right direction. So as we continue to get to the point where we could actually build this and define it for our team well enough to actually execute, um, we bring in user stories at this point. And our goal is really simple, is to try to make a note of a task that the user has to do. Uh, and, and for these kind of marketing sites, we include reading text because that gets into the fields. Um, and then also the, the results of those actions. So just really simple, um, we're doing things like display, H1, or post title with the date, author, category, and the WYSIWYG body field. So obviously that's really clear, and then we're trying to add the user role to that. This would be anonymous user. Um, there'd be a ton of tools you can make these user stories in, right? This is just an example of kind of a card uh, layout of these. Um, another user story that we might add would, would be that we're providing uh, sharing links for Facebook, Twitter, those kind of things. Um, maybe we're going to create an unpublished post to modify the uh, title, date, author, category, right? Because we're going to split up those two user roles so the blogger doesn't actually publish it. And then we're going to make another uh, card for the review, approval, and publishing of the posts uh, for that other blog approver user. Man. So these would be examples of user stories, and uh, again, the complexity is up to you. Uh, we've we found that these work really good for testing, and they give a really great lens on what the goals of the page are. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions that people might make through just looking at comps or wireframes, and this makes it clear in another way that we found very helpful. When you go to content, um, I just put this on here as pictures because this is how people generate content, meaning any way they choose to, right? You're going to have clients. I joked with one of our clients the other day, I'm going to go out and buy them a fountain pen so they can sit down at their desk, you know, and enjoy writing with a fountain pen as they write content on their legal pad. Uh, someone's just going to whip out their phone and, and write some stuff down and, and all the ways in between. So your goal at this point, uh, we've found it helpful to just not be fancy and just get some content to include with your system definition. So um, there's going to be a ton of excuses to content. I think this is actually one of the hardest parts of making a site. And uh, I mentioned I, I've done some teaching in, at the university level. I've made students cry unintentionally by asking them to write their own content. I didn't know it was that hard. But, you know, I, I mean, I knew it was hard, but I didn't know it would lead someone to cry. And I, I started to just get this impression like, okay, you know, sometimes people feel lazy, but this, is, this goes beyond that, right? To, to something that's a very challenging task that you're asking people to do, and facing that challenge uh, is, is important early in the project. Seth Godin talks about doing that hardest part first, right? You, you can do a lot of work on your business or on your site. Uh, you can do it, you know how to do it, that's great. Focusing in on one of the hardest parts uh, is, is difficult. And so this is an intentional choice to focus in on one of the hardest parts of the site first. 
uh, UI design, we got this right. So no instructions needed here. Everybody, this is everybody's favorite part usually, whether you're doing uh, hand wireframes, using the whiteboard, doing comps, you know, however you get this out, uh, every shop seems to have their own way and there's no right or wrong way, but including these kind of things in the system is, is obviously helpful. Um, and then as we jump into the back end functionality, again, we'll just kind of use a few cards, but just reminding us of um, what's on that spry site that we looked at, just to note how we would notate it in Drupal. Um, we're coming down the home page. We're coming down the home page, and there's like a blog roll under this. There's a blog roll. I think this is the wrong video. Anyway, <laughs> awesome. Um, but anyway, there's a blog roll halfway down the whole home page. There's, I think, five posts that are shown. Then you can link into the full blog. Also in the menu up top, right, there's a, a, a blog post link in the main nav. Very traditional. We've seen it a hundred times. So how might we notate that for Drupal? Um, this is, again, pretty uh, straightforward. Um, but first of all, we're going to start with the content type. Again, your team's might find this duh, and it might be in your shop that everything's a content type or nothing's a content type. Everybody does it different, uh, but just noting, okay, we're going to use a content type for this. Writing it down, or not. We're not going to use a content type for this. However you want to, right? But just writing that down is really important. Um, then uh, we might want a block view on the home page. So just noting, okay, we're going to have a block view, block view of post teasers filtered by published, sorted by post date. And it's not rocket science, but again, if you're sitting down to build the view, gets you really close. Um, page view, a uh, full post, filtered by published, sorted by post date, descending. Not rocket science, but if you're sitting down to build the view, right, you almost, you almost have this, this thing built. And then um, a node display of a single post. So again, you might use the node uh, TPL, you might never use the node TPL, you might do like a, an argument in a page view. There's a ton of ways to render this stuff, but just writing down how are you going to do it, um, stuff like that. This also, I think, is helpful if you're not going to use the node uh, TPL level, right? You, you're going to want to get rid of that somehow. Somehow you're not wanting people to get to that node level, so that's a great thing to know uh, starting out when you're building things. So um, the other things that you might want to include um, are uh, post tags. So this might be a taxonomy in Drupal. Again, it might seem really simple and straightforward, but um, uh, sometimes our folks really explicitly want things to be multiple taxonomies. So they want a taxonomy, for example, for tags in this case, and they might also want a taxonomy for categories in this case. And uh, having a discussion, should that be the same taxonomy, different taxonomy, are we going to those taxonomy pages? Uh, it, it might be a five converse, minute conversation, or again, your shop might do it one way every time, but just making sure to make a quick note of it, insanely helpful. Um, you might note then things like integrations. We talked about that this system should be able to house a lot of different types of components, integrations. So again, in this case, it would just be an Instagram embed. Maybe in other cases, it's a YouTube embed or other things like that. And then also something like a share this integration, which is potentially a site-wide integration or not, right? Depending on what content types you want to have it on. So just noting that, uh, right? I can't tell you how many times we've had to share this thing on some sidebar randomly, unstyled with default icons. And everybody's like, I don't know what they want. You know, no one's made a decision about this. So just making a note of it really quick uh, is really helpful. So again, uh, this is not rocket science, but just defining these things, there might be more, writing them down uh, in a way that works for your team and having them all there. And what we found then is the, the most important piece is that this kind of provides a bunch of different lenses to look through. Uh, the center point of this shape being, being what you're actually building, right? And this is trying to get some kind of alignment. So having these conversations or each facet, each bullet point that we talked about, business requirements, user stories, all that kind of stuff, gives us more clarity on what we're building so that <laughs> we, we, we have a pretty clear idea of it. Um, uh, the client might just see part of it, right? So the client might approve things. You might talk a lot about stuff while they're approving those deliverables that you've decided that they've approved. Other deliverables might just be for your internal team. But with all of them combined, hopefully you have a, a great idea of what you're building. 
And so uh, the only way that this analogy breaks down then of the geometric shape is that uh, we're not going to do precise pieces. This, there's no one size fits all kind of a thing. And so the last uh, aspect of this I want to talk about briefly was scale. So there's going to be systems like a blog that um, whether you want to measure the scale uh, in effort, time to build, or in user impact, however you want to talk about size, uh, there's going to be some things that are relatively small and some things that are much more uh, complex and large. And so uh, one of the things that we want to make sure to, to talk about, um, because we're dealing with people, a lot of times in developers that are very precise and specific, is that uh, this is not a one-size-fits-all situation. And so um, we're going to do things that are um, appropriate for the system, appropriate for the client, appropriate for the project, that, and, and not just to fit things into uh, a, a precise uh, unit of measurement. So this uh, system's idea isn't meant to be uh, a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, situation. So these things could change and morph into different sizes, and that's okay. Um, you might spend uh, four hours on one building one system and uh, four weeks building another, and that, that's okay. Uh, what we're not trying to do is, is to fit everything into perfect units. What we're trying to do is describe this stuff in a really clear way so that everybody knows what they're doing. So um, I, I just mentioned, you know, remember the pie thing because there's all these different uh, pieces of it and again with that scale piece uh, you're not going to come up with one size fits all. You're not going to come up with one kind type Thing that works every time, uh, but hopefully that these are reusable things that you can uh, save parts of, maybe uh, either whether it's through uh, Drupal uh, features in Drupal 7 or uh, code definitions in Drupal 8 or, or just um, uh, kind of oral tradition in your shop that you're able to reuse these concepts and then move more efficiently together as a team uh, in the future. So I think that's uh, the big part of it, the why. Um, and in building something that's going to last uh, for, for several uh, months after launch and not just for one day. Uh, just to kind of give a little, uh, and with a little thought of like what systems we use, um, I, I, did, I wanted to make this neutral and agnostic as much as we could. Um, we, we do these summaries on whiteboards, on napkins, on notebooks, Google Docs, things like that. There's nothing fancy about that, obviously. Um, we've been just doing business requirements and documents. Again, there, there might be better ways to do it uh, for your team, but we're not trying to do anything fancy here. Um, we, we've started using Trello for user stories, if that's helpful, just to get that kind of column idea. Uh, that's been very helpful for us. Uh, we're still working on content, right? The, the ideal is, is that if you include content in your system definitions, that you could even just use uh, the site, the development site, to collect content uh, with specific user roles. And obviously that's an ideal, and it never quite works that way. Uh, so, so I think we're still looking for the silver bullet on that. Uh, we present uh, design comps and wireframes within Vision, and that's been really helpful for our team. And then um, back-end functionality is kind of the task management system of your choice. Some, some people run their projects you know, through user stories, through tasks, or none of the above. And, However, that's helpful. Um, you know, we, we again have those kind of cards on the slide earlier that were things like a block view, a page view, a building out a content type. Those might be checkboxes, those might be tasks. However you all do that, uh, that's gonna be fitting into your team rhythms uh, the best. So, so that's the thought. Um, got done pretty early. Questions, comments, ideas that you've had. I'm sure people would love to learn uh, if there's anything that, that would be helpful to share as well. So. Woohoo! <laughs> Does anybody have any things that they've learned or any kind of riffs on this that might be interesting to the group? I have a question. Yeah? When you guys are planning for the next version, do you have any kind of goals for what you Yeah. Right. And so we're sort of like Bambi, like our little baby deer legs, figuring out how to stand up and walk. Yeah. And we've been sort of talking about, well, you know, 
with this particular story, are we concentrating on just the functionality, or are we also looking at you know, how it looks on the screen? And, uh, and do we divide that up into different tasks? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that um, what we talked about the, today, there's a lot of ways that you could test this stuff out. So sometimes it comes down to the preference of the development team. Um, so that's the one question I try to ask going in is like, what do you want in front of you every day to remind you of what to do? Because we all face that thing of like, whether it's task switching or um, we come into the office in the morning and we all need to be reminded of what the hell you know we're doing at that moment. So that might be a question I'd start with is, how do you need, how does it work for you to remember where, where we're going, right? And then um, the other thing I try to look for is kind of momentum of the team. So what, um, what's causing your team to, to want to move forward without uh, like a whip, you know, <laughs> or something? So, so what pulls the team forward? And, and uh, that's kind of how we start those conversations. So sometimes it's like it would, it, it's changes, so it would be helpful if you listed out every single change, right? Or sometimes we're building from scratch, so it would be helpful if you help me get the big picture goal and then I can follow the details from there. So those are the conversations we have. Again, we're still kind of trying to dial it in uh, to, to something that works every time. Yep. Great question. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, at what point in the process do you get concerned about how fast the site enters based on, uh, you know? Like load speed of the site or speed of the project? Spoiler alert, I talk about that. Yeah, so <laughs> Brian down here is going to talk about that this afternoon. Um, but I, I think that what we've um, found with a lot of those kind of things, which would include testing, is that to try to put that into a process and not be a separate task. So to try to ask everybody to test, um, everybody to help uh, think about things like speed and to have be those be more value based than task based. Does that answer at all, or is that too vague? It's a little vague, but I'll wait for this uh, session. Okay. Yeah. And again, if we're trying to get into things like. Um, Optimizing JavaScript and stuff like that. I, I'm probably not the expert on that stuff. So, great questions. So you gave a reference to that one student that was talking about the content. Yeah. Uh, what words of advice do you have about this content in general? Yeah. And because that's always a big one in terms of showcasing, you know, what content to start with or what. Yeah. Um, I think that one thing I've noticed is if you're kind of trying to equate it to something like um, it, there's different types of even like um, people that author books, right? There's some people that have never written a word in their lives and they're going to like speak the book and someone else is going to write it. You know, there's people that write books on whiteboards and big rooms and then have someone, you know, type that out or whatever. There's just people create it in different ways. And so um, sometimes you can provide them structure. That's helpful. Like if you would say, hey, we're going to have these five fields on the page. We need first name, last name, you know, whatever those are. Because then they might say, no, <laughs> those are not the right fields, right? That might be a way to start out. Um, uh, other times uh, you might get stuff that they've done historically and start to put structure on that. Um, but we just found it helpful to just try to get in the mess with folks and and try to again kind of force the issue early is the best um, is the best way we found uh, to do it because you almost face the same issue every time it's just how much you want to delay it uh, so all of this is with in mind is like if I um, expedite this issue during discovery and if they're you know frustrated at me uh, during discovery and if I'm feeling annoying at that point then I can back off and they have a long time to think about it thrash process, right, whatever they do, um, versus if I wait till the end, the site's probably delayed, so. <laughs> what would you say about the main differences between WooCommerce and DrupalCommerce? Oh, I don't know <laughs> if I'm the best person to, to talk about that, but I think, you know, one of the things that I could, could comment on is, is uh, DrupalCommerce is meant to be part of Drupal. Uh, I think WooCommerce is more of like, maybe it feels more of like a city CRM thing where it feels a little bit more of a, another integration that you'd be doing. So. WooCommerce is owned by Automatic, which you might recognize from the WordPress community. It's like the, their equivalent of Aquia. Yeah. So WooCommerce is only on the WordPress platform. They're apples and honeybees, like completely different beasts. Um, and I've built many a WooCommerce site in my previous life, so if you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I can, yeah. can talk to you about that. Yep, but Drupal Commerce is more meant to be in Drupal uh, as a system. 
What other uh, challenges are you all facing as you start projects and projects? I'm not saying because I have the solutions, but we can just talk about those. So, group therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Do you run your visualization, your, your screen layouts, the interaction? Do you run that independently in the parallel path just to get traction from an infrastructure activity? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, we probably do more of as like, we're just trying to get people to work on it, you know? Um, but if in the ideal, um, if they could be working off user stories and stuff like that, it always seems like that would be helpful. Uh, I've, we've been um, uh, fortunate at Spry to have some designers and, and creative directors that are um, willing to start with some patterns. So as much as we can be prepared to give them some patterns off the bat, they're usually willing to work with those. So things like if you're doing Drupal Commerce, for example, it's more helpful for them to see some user stories, some um, sketches of what Drupal Commerce does well, rather than just start with a blank slate. And uh, when we have the, the time to provide that, that's been helpful. Same with taxonomies. There's some standard taxonomies. Do you bring that into a particular engagement? Okay. Um, I think so. We might do that kind of through an information architecture lens when we're working on the site, um, and that would be we would kind of note there, like, would there be um, a common taxonomy to use or not? You know, and then probably a little bit further down the line. But again, I think you could cut it either way. Uh, we're just probably more trying to figure out, first of all, what their content is and how that might fit together, rather than you know if there's a standard to use yet. So. Um, can you talk about sort of the difference between business requirements and user stories? Okay. Definitely think about how, in some cases, they would be very distinct. Yeah. When they get kind of closer to each other, how do you utilize both of those things together instead of sure. Like, yeah, I think sometimes they might almost sound the same. So especially again, if in our blog example, that's when it just gets really muddy and there's no right or wrong answer. If you go from like an e-commerce perspective, a business requirement might be about shipping rules, like. Uh, they need to use shipping tables from UPS, or uh, you know, I worked at a place where we um, shipped as a um, a sub account of Groupon, right? So things like that, like we we're going to ship under the Groupon um, UPS account, and, and here's how we're going to ship our packages, because some at some point, right, you're you're giving a shipping estimate, and to give a clear estimate, for example, you would have to know that um, when the card is estimated. Um, even way before the label is printed. So that'd be a business requirement. A user story would be that they could select that kind of shipping and that they would be provided with an estimate. So um, the way I would summarize is that user stories are actionable and the business requirements are probably more um, summarized or uh, descriptive. Spoiler alert, I give a slightly different way to look at or talk about it in mind. So that might help clear it up too. Um, do you think that sort of in cases where so most of my knowledge about Agile on um, that whole, you know, methodology has kind of been inherited, like I've never um, gone through it systematically or anything like that, um, is it when people are gravitating more towards using business requirements and not user stories, would it be common to have those sort of actionable Okay. This, yeah. This is my super opinionated answer, so take it with a grain of salt, is that um, all of the Agile stuff and stuff like that is hard to do with like Drupal 7 and, and Former because that there's so much locked up in configuration in the database. So when we're doing an Angular node project, we can be way more Agile than when we're doing a Drupal project right now. And so, um, you know, obviously some of us have tried with features in Drupal 7 and then we've cried a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, that's where Drupal 8 might be strong, um, is that then since more of that's locked up in the, um, in a potential code definition, maybe that's possible. And then keep in mind too with your, um, with your integrations, you know, that sometimes you have a system where you can look at the integration almost as content that's provided to you, which is helpful, but sometimes it has just as much configuration or more as Drupal. And so that's another thing that makes the feel dependent sorry, the feel different on if you can 
um, work agilely or if you kind of have to work with the grain, which is kind of what I was talking about in this. Like Drupal has a way still if you're in seven or earlier. If you force it, it'll break, you know? So that's kind of one of the assumptions and, and then we're all excited about Drupal 8, I think. I am. So. Great questions. Any other ideas, comments? Okay. Well, I appreciate everybody's time and it's fun to be with you this morning. Feel free to reach out to me on social media if you have any other questions. Thanks for coming.